Welcome to part three of the Eisenhower era. Now we're going to talk about the Affluent Society. So in this affluent society, prosperity is widely available to more people than ever. This is, of course, symbolized by this extremely expanded middle class, right, and this massive amount of suburbanization. However, you also see it develop a conformist society. One author for Harper's Weekly wrote that uh, in 1957, he said, suburbanites are people whose ages, income, number of children, problems, habits, conversations, dress, possessions, perhaps even blood types are almost precisely as yours, right? You see this uh, uh, this very strong push to try and conform, try not to stand out, try to fit in. And there's some reasons behind this. During this time period, what happens if you're a suburbanite who is a radical or just seems a little strange? Well, well, maybe it's because you're a godless communist, right? Or one of those things, right? You don't want to draw suspicion upon yourself. And so you try and fit into these standardized norms of the day. As often is the case after a war, you have a baby boom, and the end of World War II will be no exception. Matter of fact, by 1954, Americans are having about 4 million babies per year. But you're going to have a huge increase in the American population. In the 1950s, well, between 40, 1945 and 1957, the American population is going to grow by 29 million. And it's not just the baby boom that's going to be drive, driving that, but it's also going to be the extreme reduction in infant mortality, right? Infant mortality is going to plummet with the introduction of antibiotics, uh, vaccines that uh, reduce the risk of diphtheria and typhoid fever and other infections. The Salk and Sabin vaccine is going to virtually uh, eliminate polio. Families that average about 2.4 children per household is going to increase to 3.2 uh, children per household. Right now, you have this large increase in the population, but remember, this conformist society fears that communism is going to infiltrate it, right? And so, therefore, we don't want, we want to make sure that these children don't grow up to be godless communists. Now, keyword there, godless. The idea is that communists are atheists, right? So, how do we make sure that they uh, uh, that Americans don't grow up to be atheists? Well, we start to try and influence that. For example, we're going to start putting in God we trust on our currency. We're going to add the words under God to our pledge allegiance. Hey, you can't go to church? Well, guess what? We got TVs now. Church can come to you. Catholic minister Fulton J. Sheen is going to start his own television ministry, right? Much like what Charles Coughlin was doing on the radio in the 1930s and 1940s, right? Evangelist Billy Graham is going to uh, become an evangelical minister on television as well. Television programs are going to promote family values and family ideas. Television shows like Leave it to Beaver and Father Knows Best. Even vehicles are going to adopt naming to promote family values. The four-door sedan is not going to be called the sedan anymore. It's going to be called the family car, right? All of this designed to try and promote these ideas of American values. Even you taking this class right now is, was influenced by the Cold War. One of the fears was is that when people go to universities, a place where new ideas get exchanged all the time, that that would be a hotbed for you to become a godless communist. So what do we do? Well, you need to learn why America is Murica, apostrophe M-U-R-I-C-A, Murica. How do we do that? Well, we require for your undergraduate degree that you take U.S. history. So if you're ever wondering why you're taking this class, well, you can thank Joseph Stalin. Now, this affluence didn't translate to all sectors of society, though. This is a rather heterogeneous society. When we're talking about this suburban exodus, you need to realize that we're talking about white America, really. 95% of the suburban exodus was uh, in 1950 was white. Right. Meanwhile, on the other side of the coin, African-Americans during the 1950s largely urbanized. By 1960, more than half of African-Americans, half of the African-American population lived in U.S. cities. Right. Um, so you're going to see a massive urbanization of African-Americans more so than before. 
uh, by 1953, Congress began an effort to begin Americanizing Native Americans, right? Trying to get them off of the reservation, terminating their special legal status as a sovereign group on the reservation, and wanted them to begin to move into uh, cities and in towns. Why? Well, so that they would therefore join the consumer society of the 1950s, right? So like, for example, the volunteer relocation program uh, was established uh, in the 1950s to introduce or encourage Native Americans to move away from the reservation, okay? The result is by 1960, one in five Native Americans had indeed moved into cities. Now, the unintended consequence of that was that the uh, Native Americans that did move from the reservations, which are historically very poor, into the cities were the more uh, successful of the Native American population. And so what they did was that left the, uh, those remaining on the reservations even poorer than they were before. Right. Mexican Americans had a lot to contend with as well. Right. You had during World War II a large program to try and encourage uh, Mexican nationals to come up into the United States to work. It was called the Bracero program. Right. Both the uh, manufacturers and, and the farmers loved it because you got cheap labor. Labor and for the uh, Mexican nationals who came up, they it was good for them as well because they would make a wage that was far greater than what they could have made back home. In fact, after the war was over, uh, there was uh, a lot of uh, effort by farmers to try and keep the Bracero program going. But ultimately, you're going to start seeing people uh, complain and clamor about it, right? They are taking jobs away from Americans. This is an argument that I know everybody's heard already before, right? Um, many of these, uh, these um, Mexican nationals moving into the United States begin to be referred to as mojados and wetbacks, right? And of course, this begins to translate into the Mexican-American community as well, American citizens of Hispanic uh, descent, right? Now... In 1950, Congress is going to pass the Internal Security Act, right? Out of that will come the Immigration and Nationality Act of 1952, which will begin deporting Mexican nationals, right? Uh, in 1954, the government's going to call uh, uh, create an, uh, uh, a program called Operation Wetback, and yes, I know, it's derogatory, but that's what they called it, that'll deport over a million immigrants in that year alone, right? Now... With, um, with Mexican-Americans in the United States to help protect their rights, you're going to have in 1929, way back in 1929, the formation of the League of United Latin American Citizens, or LULAC, right? And LULAC is going to be very active in the 1950s to try and protect the rights of Mexican-Americans, Tejanos, uh, and then expanding out to any other minorities here in the United States, 